time to check out a Stan Krejcik mystery, book five. Author, Grant Michaels. Publisher, St. Martin's Press. New York, 1996. Narrator, Eric Ost. Chapter 23. Next morning, I called Lieutenant San Fuente's private number and waited for his call back. But it never happened. With the Alpha wrecked, I needed an alternate set of wheels fast. So after a flimsy continental breakfast in my room, I arranged to borrow a bicycle from the guest house. As one of the houseboys adjusted the bike seat to accommodate my long legs, he advised me to return soon because the hurricane alert was being stepped up to a warning. I thanked him for the advice and told him I was from New England and had some hurricane before. He smiled and said, not like these. I pedaled out to the same remote place where I'd left the Alpha the night before. The car was gone, Brawley told away by the police. The only clues were the streaks of tire rubber and the scatterings of shattered glass and plastic on the road. As a car, the Alpha had meant nothing. It was just another hunk of metal and carefully timed explosions going on under the hood. But it did have sentimental value, for it had been a gift from a fine old friend, and it had made my Tyro brand of sleuthing a lot easier, even glamorous. Unless I rented a car immediately, I was going to be a two-wheeled detective. Then a surge of anger welled up. How dare Joshua destroy my car? A gift from a friend, no less. Heedless of any further danger, I pedaled back to the Fleming Lemming to confront him directly on the way there. I turned down an overgrown stretch of road that looked to be a shortcut. A huddle of squad cars was up ahead, flashing, blinking nervously in the early morning light. Off the side of the road was the pink cab. The front and sides were dented and scraped with black paint, where it had rammed into the Alpha. Lieutenant San Fuente saw me and motioned me over to him. What a coincidence, he said. I was just about to send for you. I was looking for you too, Lieutenant. I wondered what happened to my car. There's nothing to tell you that can't wait. You found it then. Last night, said San Fuentes. It's totaled. I guessed as much. Oh, well, it needed gas anyway. Is that a joke? Humor helps me cope, Lieutenant. Well, said San Fuentes. Someone didn't show too much humor there. He pointed toward the pink cap. Found it this morning. Trouble? Have a look, he said and led the way. Inside the cab, splayed across the front seat, was the body of Joshua 18. One side of his head had been blown away by a massive gunshot wound. The gun was still in his hand, an apparent suicide. Oh, what a mess, I said. Just like your car, said San Fuentes. Totaled. Why would he do that, I said. Maybe he didn't, said the cop. You know, most times people shoot themselves. The gun flies out of their hands, but look how neat this one is. Sitting right there in his palm. You think someone killed Joshua? It's a very real possibility, said San Fuentes. Didn't you tell me he wrecked your car last night? Yes. So maybe you decided to get even for that. <laughs> Lieutenant, I wouldn't kill someone over a car. What would it take, said San Fuentes. I didn't answer his question. I'll tell you how it looks to me, said San Fuentes. You come down here from that big city up north, and you got your fancy little car with you, and you did something that got Joshua pissed off. And then he did something that got you pissed off and you didn't know what to do next. So maybe you came here to settle the score and things got a little out of hand. I called you last night, didn't I? Would a guilty person call in the police? Depends, said the cop. And where did I get the gun, I said. Easy enough in this town, said San Fuentes. So maybe you got a gun and arranged a meeting with Joshua, and well, you might be the kind of guy whose blood boils over pretty fast. It takes one to know one, Lieutenant. Watch it, he said. We didn't have trouble like this before you came on the reef. Don't blame me if your town is an epicenter of crime. Okay, okay, said the cop. All I'm saying is, I never had headaches like the ones I'm getting since I met you. Why don't you check the registration on that gun before you start accusing me? Easy, said San Fuentes. I'm not accusing you. I'm just thinking out loud. Don't you do that sometimes? Who found the body, I said. We got a call this morning, and yes, we traced it. Came from a phone booth. Man or woman, I said. Hard to tell, said the cop. Any name. What do you think, said San Fuentes. I think the killer would be pretty stupid to do that. 
Have you notified Laura Hope yet? Well, the wife, said San Fuentes, with a wayward little gleam in his eye. We're looking for her now. And then he told one of his crew to take impressions of the bike tracks by the side of the road. Bike, I said. Or motor scooter. Can't tell yet, said San Fuentes. Might even be a motorcycle. Or velocipede, I said, trying to re deflect his suspicion from Ross. A what? A circus bike, I said to San Fuentes. At least you can't blame Jerry Takir for this one. I guess not, said San Fuentes. And you already know she didn't take the painting either. San Fuentes grunted, much the same way Brinko did in Boston. I wondered if all the rookies in the police academy learned how to make that distinctive, non-committal, manly grunt. And then San Fuentes reminded me not to leave town without telling him. I said, isn't it time you let Jerry go? He said quietly, you know why I'm keeping her. What if we have to evacuate for the hurricane? There ain't no hurricane, said the cop. It's all a ploy to distract the natives. See, they got restless off season and, and they need a little excitement. So the weather bureau tells them to run out and buy cases of sterno and batteries. I looked at him incredulously. You're kidding, right? He said flatly. Humor helps me cope, too. What about my car? It's on Stock Island, he said. Trust me, Stan, it's not worth fixing. I just want to see it. I'll take you there right later, he said. I got back on my bike and rode into town. On the way, I met Ross coming the other way on a big black motorcycle. Rafiks had been red, which proved I wasn't repeating a behavior pattern, right? I told Ross what had happened to Joshua and how he'd come after me the night before and tried to run me down on the pink cab. I was pretty shook up, I said. I was kind of hoping you might come by last night. I could have used the company. Sorry, said Ross. I was a busy. It's all right. You have to take work when you can get it. Uh, there's some things I can't tell you, darling. It's okay, Ross. There's no strings between us. No, he said. No strings, but you ought to rent yourself a car in case we have to evacuate. Can't we get out on your motorcycle? Not in a hurricane, said Ross. Just then a red Range Rover passed us. I've seen that thing before, I said. Ross said it was Ken Kimball's new car, just a few days old. I told him I knew that because I'd seen him get into it at the Gulf Coast Playhouse, but I'd also seen it sometime before that, and I wouldn't, couldn't recall when. Again, I recalled the notion of Her Majesty's Country Carriage, then also came in association to Key West local majesty, the Countess Rolalinska. Ross's voice broke into my mental meanderings. You want to get together tonight? Sure, I said easily. Ross grinned, then revved the motorcycle's engine and rode off. I apologized to my dead lover, explained to him that it was only a visceral response. I had for Ross a loneliness that was easily solved by physical companionship. I was convinced that my heart, or what was left of it, was still my own. I turned up Whitehead Street to pay a call on the Countess Rodlinska and probe the subconscious link I'd made between her and Ken Kimball's car. But her shop was locked up. Yet, through the thin walls of the converted cottage, I heard sounds within her heavy footsteps and cabinet doors being opened and slammed shut. I knocked heavily on the door of the shop. The countess opened it and couldn't conceal her surprise and displeasure at seeing me. I was expecting someone else, she said in her high regal tone. I'm sorry to disappoint you, I said. I am not disappointed, she replied. I am annoyed. Now please, I must prepare for the storm. You should leave town yourself. And then she added ominously, why you are still able. How are you planning to get off the island, I said. Kenneth will drive us. Where is he now, I said. He has managed to attend to, she replied. Joshua team is dead, I said. The countess sniffed coldly and said, really? What has that to do with me? He used to work for your friend Adolf Doberman. Adolf Doberman was not my friend, she said, and Joshua was a very mm, colorful character. But I had no business with him. Now, please, will you leave? Just then, a wild gust of wind tore a huge palm branch from a nearby tree and crashed it against the roof of the porch outside. The countess cried out in alarm. Then, 
As the wind just as quickly receded, she regained her composure. Are you leaving? She said again, but this time she almost sounded afraid I might leave her alone. Not yet, I replied. Very well, she said. I must pack my valuables. She went back into the shop, and I followed her. Her valuables consisted of all the original artwork that she transferred electronically to some of the expensive t-shirts she sold. That art was irreplaceable, especially at the poultry slum for which it had been obtained. The countess rolled each one up separately and inserted it into a cardboard tube, and then inserted that tube into a second waterproof plastic tube. I said, did you ever see the missing painting, the one called Dinner of Uncertainty? Why do you ask me that? She said, I know that you and Ken Kimball are close friends, and he collects art. I also know he had the painting for a while. Who told you? She said. I saw Polaroid snapshots at his place, so I wondered if you ever saw the painting when he had it. Where is he? She said impatiently, looking toward the door. Why don't you call him? I said. He is not at home, she said quickly. But you all have cellular phones, I countered. The storm has interrupted our service. Countess, I said. Did Ken take that painting from the crow's nest? Of course not, she said. He is innocent. Do you know who did? Was it Adolf Doberman? Adolf, she muttered resentfully. Where is the great Adolf Doberman now? He thought he was so clever. Ha! Clever? How? He was a braggadocio, she said. He was always trying to put himself above me, because I'm a true aristocrat, and he was just a commoner with money. He told me how he would outsmart his partners. He was going to buy all of Peter's property from Augusta for himself. For Mindful Lotus, you mean? For himself, she insisted. I know nothing of any Lotus thing. Why do you always say that? So did Adolf kill Augusta, I said. I am sure of only one thing, she said. I have no blood on my hands. There wasn't blood on Augusta Willets or Adolf Doberman, though he was strangled with one of your t-shirts. The countess arched one eyebrow. That was a clever ruse to incriminate me. Why, I said. Who? Someone who was envious of me. As if on cue, there was an ominous knock on the door. Then the door was unlocked from the outside and flung open, all done quickly in a single three-part gesture. Knock, unlock, open. He's dead, cried King Kimball before he realized the Countess was not alone. He looked at me and muttered, What are you doing here? The Countess explained how she had mistakenly opened the door earlier, thinking I was Ken. Stasia, I told you I'd let myself in, he said shortly. You did, Kenneth, but I am so worried that I forgot. Don't be angry, please. We have much to do before the storm. Yes, he said. Then he turned to me. Unless you want to help me board up the place, you're only in the way here. I agreed to help, and he quickly explained what had to be done, which was basically to batten down the shutters from inside the cottage, then to install fiberglass panels across the large glass pitcher window at the front of the store. So into temporarily enforced labor, I went bartering drudgery for clues. Ken and I went outside to install the fiberglass panels along the front of the store. My task was to balance a large panel upright while Ken fastened it to the porch floor. I saw his red Range Rover parked out front and finally the repressed memory was freed and I remembered where I'd seen the car before. It was no wonder I'd forgotten the moment, for I'd just witnessed the second corpse in two days. I murmured quietly to Ken to keep the Countess from hearing us. I saw your new car at Jerry Takir's gallery the day Adolf Doberman was killed. Ken looked up at me from where he was kneeling on the porch from a floor. He squinted his eyes. I said, why did you lie to me, Ken? You're the one who returned at Dinner of Uncertainty to Jerry's gallery. I was never there that morning, said Ken. But there's no mistake in your car. You may think because it's new, people wouldn't recognize it, but you made the mistake of buying a very distinctive car. I told you I wasn't at the gallery that morning. Then maybe someone else borrowed your car and returned the painting for you. Are you protecting a guilty person? Who's guilty, he said aloud. From inside the shop, the countess called out, Kenneth, did you say something? Ken called back. 
These damn panels are the devil to latch, Stasia. I said quietly. What's happening at the Gulf Coast Playhouse? I was able to get a temporary stop work order. Who issued it? Ken glared. Nancy Drew. What did that take? Blackmail or bribery? I think you may have misunderstood her, said Ken. She was very agreeable to the idea of halting construction. That's not what you said the other day outside her office. My reaction then was based on the misinformation you gave me. I said, what about your friend Etzel? What about him? said Ken irritably. Are you sure he really wants to preserve the Gulf Coast Playhouse? Of course he does. Ed loves the theater. He also loves Hollywood. Maybe he has other plans he hasn't told you about. Ken said, Ed and I are professional friends. I'd know if he was lying to me. Did he know about Adolf's plan to buy all the property directly from Augusta? What are you talking about? said Ken. I nodded toward the interior of the shop. Your friend, Stasia, just told me about it. Sounds like Adolf had a neat little plan to cross his partners. He said, Stasia told you that? I nodded again. Ken said, tell me exactly what she said. I did, the whole story. Then added, I assumed you knew everything too. Well, I didn't, he said, now angry. Why would she tell you of all people and not me? Beats me, I said. I wonder if she told Etzel too. I'll find out, said Ken. Sounds like your friends are keeping things from you. Shut up, said Ken. Where had all his blissful self-realization gone? I said, now will you tell me what you were doing at Jerry Takir's gallery the day Adolf was killed? As I recall now, the car was dripping water slightly as though it had just been washed. Enough, said Ken as if a stinging insect was bothering him. The last of the panels was secured and he stood up. He said, you seem to thrive on mistrust. I can see you enjoy the idea that Ed would betray me, that he'd use anything I've told him against me. It's not unknown even among friends. You're wrong there, said Ken. Unlike you, I trust my friends, unconditionally. That's too bad, I said. We went back into the shop, where the Countess was still struggling to fasten the same shutter she'd been at when we left her to go outside. Ken was, went over and latched it with a simple, strong gesture. Thank you, Kenneth, she said. It takes a man to do things right. But I saw a troubled look on Ken Kimball's face. He didn't seem to be on home ground at the moment. Perhaps my cynicism had sparked new doubts in his relationship to his friend, Etzel Sham, and to his confidant, the Countess Rolinska. For her part, the Countess seemed oblivious to any uneasiness from Ken. But when I finally left them alone in the shop, I heard their anxious voices through the thin walls. He saw my car, Stasia. Who will be next, Kenneth? Then their voices became low and undistinguishable. I got on my bike and continued riding up Whitehead Street. On the way, I tried to make sense of what I just got from the Countess and Ken. Adolf Doberman had planned to buy all of Peter Willett's property directly from Augusta. And that could only happen if she won her contest of Peter's will. And she had, but it was after her death. So everything went to the church and Adolf was left high and dry. Then why had he been in those meetings with Edsel Sham and Nancy Drew? If he was an independent agent, maybe he was a double agent? The other odd thing was no one seemed to be grieving over Joshua A.T. So I decided to express my condolences to his recent widow. A Gay Mysteries Audiobooks I think it is easy to hate a label, but a face humanizes the word. So this effort is twofold, to offer comfort to those like myself that your world didn't end because you don't fit into the view of acceptable society on both sides, and in hopes of helping those with family that are LGBTQ, that it doesn't mean we are aliens from the child they once knew, reassure them so they can maybe be supportive at the same time being true to their values.